Yes, so this is a, uh, the Keep Monthly Seminar uh, series um, is initiated from, from the community of, of developers of, uh, of Kipi. Um, and Kipi is a, a repository for trained predictive models for genomics, uh, which we uh, released uh, a few years ago, and where we, we try to have a, a central repository for um, trained models that can be shared uh, across the community and also used in a, in a standard uh, fashion, uh, both for people developing uh, models, but also uh, people applying it, uh, for instance, to, to interpret genomes. Now we, we had a, a, a similar series centered around the, the developers and, and, and direct users of, of KP. And then we started to uh, invite um, speakers or soldiers to talk about their science and eventually developed into um, a separate meeting, which is now uh, the one uh, you're attending that focus on, on scientific presentations. And so um, we'll have uh, now this uh, TP monthly seminar uh, that focuses on scientific talks. It's uh, held every um, first Wednesday of the month at 5.30 uh, CET. And uh, we were interested in, in, in uh, research about uh, applications of deep learning for genomics in the, in the very broad sense. So uh, it includes regulatory genomics, it includes uh, proteomics, functional genomics, why not cell imaging? We haven't heard that yet, but that would be definitely in the scope of the, the type of research uh, we would like to hear here. Uh, so I, as example, as uh, latest talks, we heard about gene expression prediction by uh, Vikram Agarwal, uh, large-scale chromatin models by uh, David Kelly, uh, also models on 3D uh, genome folding uh, with Ron Schlesinger, and Uwe uh, lately told us about uh, modeling uh, binding sites of RNA binding proteins. So we keep um, gathering um, names of speakers by uh, sort of the community. And so feel free to uh, uh, promote yourself and to submit your own uh, research. We will be very uh, uh, glad to hear young researchers. So for instance, by uh, replying to your registration uh, confirmation email, uh, pointing for exa example to a preprint, um, that would be uh, uh, very nice and we'll be happy to use this platform uh, for you to, to. A few words on, on the organization. This has evolved a bit now. Uh, so we, uh, we use this um, Zoom registration uh, webpage for gathering all the registration. So please use that. Um, from now on, we also uh, will ask if the speaker wants to uh, record the presentations. Um, and that will definitely change a bit the, 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 the degree of interactivity potentially than we used to have when we were uh, in a smaller uh, circle. So we will want to nevertheless still have this type of interactions we used to have. So uh, we will uh, keep a slot after the presentation for off record questions if you don't want to be recorded and we will definitely encourage young researchers to, to ask questions. Um, we ask also our speakers to, to uh, allow a bit of time slots in the middle of their, their, their talk to have interrogate questions so that we, we don't lose people. And so raise a hand if you have questions at, at, those, at those moments. And otherwise, uh, since we are quite a few now, uh, please uh, mute while uh, the speaker is, uh, is talking. So uh, thanks, I hand it now to, uh, to Laura who is uh, chairing the, the talk. So Laura Martins, uh, please. Again, feel free to, like as Julianne said, please interrupt with questions as I'm presenting. Uh, I tend to like that more than just questions at the end. And I'll try to monitor the time. So uh, we this lasts for an hour. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm assuming that since the Kipi is a model zoo for genomics, most people have like a general genomics background, but I'll still you know, for those of you who might be switching over from other fields. Um, so, you know, this is an overview of, of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so first I'll talk about why we want to use interpretable machine learning uh, for the regulatory genomics, which is what the Kandaji lab focuses on. Um, and I'll talk about the BPNet paper, which recently came out in Nature Genetics. Um, Julianne's student, uh, Giga, was actually, is actually first author uh, on that paper. Uh, and it's a very cool application of interpretable deep learning. 
uh, and you know, it, I'll interleave the case study uh, with talking about the algorithms. And um, as Laura had mentioned, I'll, I'll focus on mostly on deep lift and TF Medisco, uh, but feel free to ask questions and I can talk at length about, you know, the different types of <laughs> ways that you could uh, interpret these models and their pros and cons. Um, but this is what I'll, I'll focus on for this talk. All right, so um, starting off, why do we want to use interpretable machine learning? Um, so generally, uh, regulatory genomics is concerned with understanding what the what in the DNA sequence determines regulatory activity. So it just is a to orient you with the picture of how gene regulation at, at a high level works. Uh, in the same way that the DNA sequence of the gene is part of our genome, uh, the DNA sequence of a regulatory element is also part of our genome. And these regulatory elements, or the sequences that regulatory elements contain motifs, which are basically patterns in the DNA sequence that proteins call transcription factors like to bind to. Um, so for example, GAT, AAT, is a, it's a pattern that's recognized by the gather transcription factor. And so you have these transcription factors that are binding to the sequence at regulatory elements. Uh, and because of the three-dimensional nature of the genome, uh, regulatory elements plus the transcription factors that are binding to them will just naturally come into proximity of, uh, of the DNA sequence of a gene. And when they are in proximity, uh, they recruit the machinery that is needed to regulate the expression of the gene. So this is just a high level picture of how gene regulation is working. The key thing is these trans transcription factors that bind to motifs and yeah. Okay, and the reason we really are interested in regulatory genomics and or one of the reasons is that uh, over 90% of disease associated mutations uh, from things like GWAS studies don't occur in the DNA sequence of genes. They actually occur in the DNA sequence of regulatory elements. Uh, and that's simply, well, first of all, the genes are only about 2% of your genome. Regulatory, uh, regulatory elements can constitute a much larger fraction of your genome. So just that's one, that's one of the reasons why disease associated mutations are much more likely to be in regulatory elements. There's just more regulatory elements compared to genes. Um, and the way that would work is if you have a mutation that disrupts a motif, then the appropriate transcription factor won't bind to the motif. Uh, and then you will, the, the transcription factor is necessary for recruiting the machine reader to, to regulate the gene expression. So if the transcription factor is not binding correctly, you won't get correct gene expression. Um, but the catch is that, you know, there's actually many positions in the regulatory element that are not super relevant for the binding of the transcription factor. So if you mutate a position that's outside a motif and has no relation to the binding of the, the TF, uh, you actually won't see much of a change in gene expression. Um, so uh, when we're looking at your genomes and you have many different polymorphisms, you and many of them are occurring in regulatory DNA, uh, you might want to know which ones are, are actually likely to have a phenotypic effect and which ones are probably completely benign. Um, so that's why, uh, because many of the positions in a regulatory element are not super essential for its function, uh, we have this question of which positions in a regulatory element actually matter. And that's a hard question to answer because it requires understanding the sequence determinants of gene expression. So how do we go about uh, tackling this question? And the approach that we can take, you know, uh, that has, is currently pushing the frontiers is we train a uh, complex model that is able to predict these uh, regulatory activity very well. And then we interpret the model to understand what it has learned. So just to give more details on that, uh, you have these, here I've depicted transcription factors binding to DNA, and then you can have uh, these assays that measure the protein binding signal of transcription factors, for example, ChIP-seq. And there's also many types of assays. Other assays will measure things like accessibility. There's uh, the you know, histone modifications. There's several readouts of regulatory activity that you could measure. And in this example, I'm just giving ChIP-seq, um, which is a measure of protein binding um, or transcription factor binding. And so you use those sequences to get your labels. Your labels might be, say, the regions surrounding uh, a a strong peak, you might, if you're doing binary classification, you might call that your positive set and the regions that are uh, that don't have strong signal, you might call that your negative set in the case of binary classification. And then what you do is you feed the sequences underlying these, uh, these regions that you've labeled to your machine learning model. In this case, uh, convolutional neural networks tend to work quite well. Um, and 
the you, you toss the machine learning model with predicting the signal that uh, came from the experiment. Uh, and then once you get a model that is really doing well, and uh, generally it's very complex models like support vector machines, deep learning models that are that get state of the art performance. The simpler models that are quote unquote interpretable by design, uh, they don't tend to get state of the art performance at this. So when if you want if you want to push the frontiers of what you know, you want to use one of these models that are actually able to predict things that the other the simpler models can't predict. Uh, and once you have those models, you then want to mine them for insight. So you interpret them to understand the sequence features that they learned. Okay, so to give just a, a recent case study, um, this was a project that studied the binding of key transcription factors that regulate uh, pluripotency in, in mouse embryonic stem cells. Uh, so you, you have the Yamanaka factors, OP4, SOX2, NANOG, and KLF4. Um, and uh, the, the the experiment in this case was Chip Nexus, which is which is like Chip Exo in that it produces a base pair resolution uh, readout of the transcription factor binding signal. And when you have this, you know, base pair level as, uh, base pair level resolution, you will tend to you, you will very distinctly see uh, around transcription factor binding sites the, the the signal from these experiments will produce characteristic quote unquote footprints uh, that uh, that that are determined by the physics of how the, the transcription factor is binding, uh, you will, it, it will look like a very distinctive pattern surrounding the motif. Um, so those, those footprints are a very strong signal that the transcription factor is actually binding here. Um, and you, you see the footprints to a lesser extent in assays like ChIP-seq, but when you go down to base pair resolution, that's when they become very distinctive. So here is an example of you know, what the footprints might look like uh, around this you know, key regulatory element that I think it's a OCT4 enhancer that's depicted here. And this is very high resolution data from Julia Zeitlinger's lab. And um, what uh, what this project did, this is BPNet and Giga was the first author, it was you know, joint collaboration. Um, you know, uh, it, Giga visited the Pindaji lab for a summer and that's how this project uh, got kicked off. Uh, the idea is to train a model to predict this base pair resolution signal and in particular predict the shape of these footprints from DNA sequence. Uh, so uh, you've probably seen from previous talks that generally in, in these setups, the input is one hot encoded DNA sequence. So A is one, C is, sorry, A is one zero zero zero, C is zero one zero zero and so forth. Um, and the structure of the DeepNet model, um, and this is the, the associated paper if you want to take a look, recently published in Nature Genetics. Um, Sorry, the uh, the output of the deep model model is to predict. So this is this is kind of subtle. It's it's not predicting the signal directly. It's predicting the shape of the the distribution of reads. Uh, that is, in, for each strand, you're predicting what fraction of the reads in a particular output window are observed at each phase. So you're, you're predicting the probability distribution over the reads. And this setup, this formulation of the prediction task, turns out turns out to be essential for actually a, achieving good performance. Um, and the architecture uh, is actually just a, a convolutional neural network through and through. Um, and there are, uh, to increase the receptive fields, there in later layers, actually dilated convolutions are what are, what are used, not just standard convolutions. Dilated convolutions are standard convolutions, but you, you essentially uh, intersperse, you stretch out the, the weights so it has a higher receptive field, and in between you, you pretend you have zero weights. So, uh, for the same number of parameters, you can actually end up with a larger receptive field. And there are residual connections, which make it easier to train deeper models. Um, and so uh, uh, at the very last output layer, you apply a softmax uh, lengthwise in order to get the probability distribution. Uh, which So remember, what you're predicting is the probability distribution over where the reads will fall. And uh, the key is to the loss function is ends up being very critical for this task. So uh, Giga uh, used the multinomial loss function. So you predicted a probability distribution, then you observe some reads, uh, and you can measure the likelihood, the log likelihood of observing that read distribution with respect to your predicted probabilities using a multinomial loss function. Uh, and the multinomial loss function is actually very clever because it automatically uh, scales according to the read depth. Right? If you have fewer reads then the log likelihood is going to be correspondingly lower because you have fewer observations. So uh, the multinomial loss function is probably the most natural way to deal with the fact that some, some loci will have fewer reads than other loci. It will scale uh, in 
the most statistically correct way. Um, in order to deal with the uh, experimental bias uh, in this architecture, you can actually append a control signal track uh, at a later layer and treat it as an extra channel in the convolutions. Um, it so happens that for predicting the, uh, the profile shape, the model doesn't tend to use the control signal track that much, but uh, at least so far, I mean, this, this may just be a question of the formulation, but you're able to get pretty good uh, predictions for the profile, even without that control signal track appended. Um, and uh, in this paper, uh, the profiles were multitasked across the four different TFs that you saw, because they, they, they synergize and they co-bind. So there's definitely a lot of, uh, lot of benefit to multitasking, a lot of cause for learning in that sense. Um, and although I've focused on the prediction of the, the signal shape, uh, in the BeaconNet paper, there's actually a separate output task head that is predicting the total number of counts. So that, that is more analogous to a regression task. And there you use a standard mean square error lo loss on the log of the, of the predicted counts. Um, but for now, I'll focus on the, the profile task because um, profile prediction task, because that achieves very good performance and uh, tends to yield the best uh, interpretation or yeah, most interesting interpretations. OK, um, yeah. So uh, just I mentioned that the profile prediction achieves extremely good performance and to give you a sense of what that looks like. Uh, if this is the observed signal track uh, shown uh, both OCT4 and SOX2 chip nexus signal, um, this is the predicted signal track. You can see that the BPNet is able to very effectively identify where the signal tends to peak. Um, and in, uh, in, in many cases, especially when the read depth is lower, the BPNet signal will look like a denoised version of the, of the true signal. Um, and uh, you can actually quantify this uh, prediction accuracy, not just visually, but um, in a more systematic way. Uh, and uh, so you will define positives as regions where the signal peak is above a certain threshold and negatives as the, the rest is. So if you do that and you compute an AUPRC for how well are you able to predict where the signal tends to peak, um, it turns out that uh, for some of the tasks, uh, the BPNet models do even better than what you would get if you use experimental replicates. Um, so the, the models are very effective at predicting the shape of the of the signal peaks. And you might think, you know, uh, these models are, the, the receptive field of this, these models are uh, on the order of a, a thousand base pairs. So you might think, you know, I know that enhancers loop over and why, how are they able to achieve such good performance? Well, one of the, one of the things you can infer from the very good performance of the signal shape prediction is that the signal shape is actually determined by the local sequence context mostly. Um, the counts prediction doesn't do as well as the uh, as the profile prediction and the, the prediction of the total counts, which is more like the signal intensity, that uh, is influenced by things like distal sequence context. But when it comes to actually just predicting the profile shape, that is uh, from this you can infer that it's more determined by the local sequence context. So the the local motifs will determine the footprints uh, that uh, that you observe around the motifs. Um, so there's a difference between the shape of the signal and the intensity of the signal. And that's why having the profile prediction and just focusing on the probability distribution seems to do extremely well. And that formulation was necessary in order to get this very good performance. Okay, um, so now that we have this extremely good performance, we want to then interpret the models to understand what is driving the prediction. Um, so, um, so now let me talk about uh, the, the two algorithms and there's, sort of two questions when it comes to interpretation that build on each other. And the first question uh, is concerned with for a given sequence, you want to understand which positions within the sequence were uh, driving the prediction. Um, so, uh, you know, for, so to, to talk about algorithms that answer that, that first question, which is for a given sequence, if you want us to understand which bases are the ones that are, you know, pushing up the footprints, for example, um, I'll just orient you. One of the naive things you might try to do is to identify the important positions is something called um, in silico mutagenesis. So um, this is easier to explain in the context of binary prediction. So I'll, I'll talk about binary prediction and then we will return to the interpretation of the BeaconNet model. But uh, imagine that we had set up a simple binary model and we wanted to understand which bases in the input sequence 
were uh, important for driving up that prediction, one thing that you might intuitively try to do is to perturb each individual position and then look at the change in the output. So you might change the C to an A and see how the output changes. And you might repeat this for every possible mutation you can make uh, and then repeat that perturbation at every position. And each time you, we would compute the change in the output. Okay. So um, this is a, a, a perfectly reasonable approach to use, uh, but then it has a couple of drawbacks. One is the runtime, because it, it's, every time you make a perturbation, you're recomputing the output. And there's ways to speed this up, but it's still, it's still a bit computationally expensive. Uh, and the other is a more subtle issue, um, which is one of uh, saturation. Uh, and to illustrate the issue of saturation, consider this very simple uh, function where you have two inputs, I1 and I2. Uh, they feed into this intermediate neuron that we'll call Y in. Uh, and then you have your output neuron, uh, which is, uh, it saturates in the value of its input. So it'll increase linearly from zero one. And then once the total signal in, uh, exceeds one, you get the saturation. Um, so now if we consider the point where I, I1 is equal to one and I2 is equal to two, uh, the output yo is a one. And if at this point we were to perturb i1 from a one to a zero, we actually would not observe any change in the output. Um, and the same if we were to perturb i2. So if you perturb each input individually, you won't, change, you won't see any change. Uh, and in order to, this, this might lead you to misleadingly conclude that neither i1 nor i2 are relevant for the output. And if you want to avoid this saturation, then you have to start perturbing combinations of inputs, which will start to combinatorially uh, increase the computational cost. Um, so that's computational uh, cost will start to very much become an issue if you want to get around these problems. So another approach you could take is a more heuristic approach, and that's a family of backpropagation based approaches. Uh, so the idea there is you start at the output and then you look at the connections between that output neuron and the neurons in below, and you look at the activations of those neurons and you heuristically assign contribution scores to the neurons in the layer below. Uh, and then you repeat this process. You look at the, you start with those neurons and then look at the connections to the neurons in the layer below and back propagate, uh, the, assign contribution scores to the neurons in the layer below. Uh, you, and you back down through the network until you reach your input. Uh, and the idea is that positive scores are, represent bases that according to your heuristic method, these bases appear to be driving the prediction up and negative scores are bases that appear to be driving the prediction downwards. So negative scores are negatively, uh, bases with negative scores are driving down transcription factor binding, bases with positive scores seem to be driving up transcription factor binding. Okay, uh, and the most uh, basic method in this family is simply computing the gradients of the input bases with respect to the output. And this is different from the gradients that are used during training, because uh, gradients during training are computed with respect to the weights of the network. In this case, you're computing, you're, you're backing down one step below and you're computing the gradients with respect to the input to the model. And so this is also called sensitivity analysis because you are literally measuring the local sensitivity of the output to, uh, with respect to each position in the input. And the reason backpropagation based approaches are, effect, are efficient is in a single backward class, you get the contributions from all the bases in the input. Um, now, uh, the deep lift, which is the method that was used in the BPNet paper, is also uh, in this family of backpropagation based approaches. And there's, there's several other methods uh, that you could use, and I can talk about the pros and cons of them in the context of genomics. Uh, but uh, for now, we'll focus on deep lift. And to understand why we developed deep lift, you understand the issue with the gradients is that they actually also face the saturation problem. Right, uh, gradients by definition, they're a measure of what the response of the model is locally. So if you're in a region of your output function where the signal has saturated with respect to your inputs, then the gradient is gonna be zero by definition. This is what saturation means, right? Um, so to give a sense of how DeepLift gets around this saturation problem, um, the idea in DeepLift is that you uh, look at the activations of the neurons with respect to the activations that those neurons have when you supply a baseline or a reference input. Um, and I can, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what the, a good choice of baseline is, but in this example, imagine that your, your baseline 
uh, that you, and you can use domain nulls to decide what a baseline is. But imagine in this example that the baseline input you you would consider it to be i one equals zero and i two equals zero. That's the, your reference input that you're measuring the contributions with respect to. Um, and the idea is that uh, you know you look at uh, so if the reference input is i one equals zero and i two equals zero, then at the point where i one is one and i two is one, the difference from reference of i one is one, and the same for i two. Um, and the idea is that you now look at that output neuron uh, YO, and you look at the activation of that output neuron under the reference. And under the reference, uh, the, activation, uh, the activation of YO is zero. Uh, because the reference is I1 and I2 equals zero, and that, that's the value that YO has at that point. But now when you contrast uh, the reference value of YO to the actual value of YO under your, your true input, uh, you see that when I1 plus I2 is equal to two, the difference from reference of Y, that's delta Y, is plus one and not zero. And this, the fact that Y is different from its reference value is what tells you that something interesting has happened. Uh, you use this difference from reference to tell, uh, to get around the saturation problem, because even though the gradient of YO is zero with respect to its inputs, the difference from reference is not zero. So you use that difference from reference information to backpropagate your contribution scores, and you backpropagate your contribution scores in a way um, such that the uh, such that the total contributions over all of your inputs will equal the difference from reference of the output. Um, so the detailed backpropagation rules are in the paper, but this is the, the high level insight that we leveraged uh, in the context of genomics. Um, you know, sometimes an, an all zero reference will work and you'll get reasonable and clean important scores without any apparent artifacts. Uh, but uh, if you want to know what the current recommendation is for something to use out of the box, uh, I would recommend uh, multiple shuffled versions of the input sequence. So you, you use multiple references. You don't have to just limit yourself to one reference. You compute the contribution scores for each uh, of the references, and these references are, are randomly generated by shuffling the input sequence, and then you average the contributions over all the different choices of the reference. And that will, of course, increase your computational cost. And it's true that in the BTNet paper, uh, it seemed like an all zero reference was working fine, and, and that, that was what was used. Uh, but this is just something to keep in mind that sometimes it may not work for you. Okay, cool. Um, so coming back to the uh, case study of the regulatory genomics uh, with the embryonic stem cells. Um, so this is what you get for the deep of contribution scores uh, at, uh, uh, at the optical distal enhancer, which is a very critical uh, enhancer. And what you find is that uh, you know, uh, there's multiple different motifs that are regulating this. Um, and depending on uh, depending on the task, depending on the, the footprint task that, because remember you, you are multitasked across these four different TFs, depending on the TF, uh, different parts of the sequence are important. So this is, the supervised formulation is, it, it will be able to very specifically tell you which parts of the sequence are relevant for a particular task. And you can contrast this with what you get if you were to just blindly do a motif scan, which you know, doesn't actually use a trained model because um, blindly with a motif scan, it'll just highlight all the possible motifs in the sequence. It won't actually tell you which motifs are relevant for which tasks. And that's where a supervised formulation is very helpful because you can tell that uh, for KLF4, uh, you know, the, you see these motifs, at the, these green motifs at the, at the ends that are relevant. Uh, those motifs are not at all driving the signal for Octor, SOX2, or Nanog. And you know, for Nanog, you get uh, the signal, this, this is a Nanog motif actually at the flank. Um, but that nanog, it, it's interesting. You see that the the oxox motif is relevant for the nanog footprint, but the nanog the the nanog motif is not relevant for the ox or sox two footprints. And this is a kind of directionality that was teased apart in the in the in the BPNet paper. It, it's nanog seems to be indirectly binding uh, to these uh, pioneer TFs, and that's why you you see this asymmetry in which motifs are relevant for which task. So you can tease apart all these interesting things when you when you backpropagate the importance at the sequence level. Avanti, so uh, may, I, may I interrupt already? Or? Of course. Yeah, okay. So in this, yeah, you have this nice example for, it's on deep lift. So mm -hmm. you say you have a, an example where, where the two variables, I1 and I2 are important. Your mm -hmm. reference is zero, and, and then you attribute half to each. Mm -hmm. uh, what if there were a, a, a third variable? 
that has no impact, right? Actually in the function, but you would nonetheless compare your zero, 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 three times to a one, 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 three times. Would you give a, a third to each? Uh, how do you? So if the, if that third input uh, had a weight of zero, and so it was genuinely not important, then the heuristic that Deepuf uses would notice that the weight connecting that input to the, to, um, to the next neuron was zero, and it wouldn't propagate an important signal. Because yeah, it's, it, deep of use is not just the difference from reference, but also the weight between that neuron oh, so and- So it's engineered in there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good question. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So this is showing you that you can get a lot of richness by looking at individual sequences, uh, but you can have hundreds of thousands of sequences in your data set. And at some point you might wanna know what the recurring patterns across all those sequences tend to look like. So this is where um, an, the second algorithm that I'll talk about, which is TF Medisco, comes in. Um, so, uh, and the idea behind TF Medisco is to actually answer this question of what are the recurring patterns across different input sequences. Before I talk about TF Medisco, I'll talk about something that people often do in, in our field uh, it, when trying to interpret these deep learning models. And that is to uh, visualize individual filters. Um, so what do you get when you do that? Well, on the left, I've shown, I've shown those, the filters from the deep bind model, which is the first uh, application of deep learning uh, to genomics. Um, and if you look at the filters for deep, the deep bind model, which is just a, I think, yeah, there's just one convolutional layer in the deep bind model, if I'm recalling correctly. Even there, you see a lot of redundancy between the different filters. There's, there's multiple different GATA motifs. Some of them have some flanking sequence over here. Some of them don't. Um, and this is a, an example of what you get when you, this is, a, yeah, I think, I think Sleepy was also from the deep bind. Um, I, and I think some of these were uh, or using the technique from the Bassett paper. Um, sorry, this, this slide is a little bit old. Um, but in, in the Bassett paper, or this, uh, this, this is another approach that is used where you, you look at the sequences that activate a filter and then you aggregate the, the, the sequences that tend to activate a filter. But even in that case, uh, you tend to see a lot of redundancy between uh, the, the different filters. Because, because, and the idea, this is inherent to the way convolutional neural networks train. Um, convolutional neural networks are not trained to give you uh, interpretable in, individual filters. When a network sees a sequence, multiple different filters are going to cooperate in order to predict the output. And you see this in computer vision as well. Uh, if you interpret the filters in a computer vision model that is trained to do face recognition, you'll get 20 different filters that are all recognizing different eyes. And it's not as though only one of those filters will fire, will fire when it sees a particular face. The, it's the combination of filters that will fire in order to, in aggregate, describe what an eye tends to look like. Um, so the same thing is happening here. You have multiple different filters and they're all cooperating to describe uh, what patterns need to be recognized. So it's not like these GATA filters, only one of them is going to fire on a particular sequence. It's multiple are going to fire and in aggregate, they're going to describe something. Um, and so this, this problem of filter visualization, particularly when you have multiple layers in your network, uh, it, it, you get a lot of redundancy and it's very hard to tease apart what's actually going on. So a totally different approach that we can take is to realize that when we had these important scores derived through something like deep lift, uh, you know, important scores like this, these important scores, they're derived by backpropagating through the entire network. So they are in a sense, uh, a readout of how important each base is to the entire network when it works as a whole. So the idea in that TF Medisco takes is you start with these input level important scores that are in a sense revealing the combined contribution of each position to the network output. Uh, and then you segment to regions of high importance. We call these segments, quote unquote, secrets. Uh, you, there's a lot of magic in here. You cluster these segments into segments that look similar. Uh, and then once you have your clusters, you aggregate the segments within each cluster to get these really nice consolidated motifs. Um, and so the algorithm is called TF motif discovery from importance scores. I will not be upset if you don't capitalize it the way I have. 
this is something that stresses people people out they say they can never remember how i have capitalized it that's fine um yeah so uh and the these uh motifs that you get when you aggregate the 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 uh, important scores at individual sequence you combine them together uh we call these contribution weight matrices so they are you can think of them as a little bit like pwms in that they they reveal the preference for a particular basis at each positions but instead of the weights coming from the one hot the frequency of observing a particular base the weights are actually derived through the important scores there or uh we also call those important scores contribution scores so these are contribution weight matrices that you get and you'll see the term CWMs or contribution weight matrices in the BPNet paper. That's why I mention it. Okay, so a few more details on this magic that went into the of Mintisco in those steps where I'm like, oh, you just magically cluster the C clip. So there's a, a fair bit that goes in there. Um, so just a little bit lower level, the, the way that clustering C clip works is that you compute the pairwise affinities between segments of high importance using a cross correlation like metric. It's not cross correlation. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, but the idea is you, you slide the sequence across each other, you find the alignment that gets the best similarity, and you use the similarity at that best alignment as the similarity between each pair of sequence. Um, and this will give you an affinity matrix between uh, all the pairs of sequence. Uh, and you can then run community detection on that affinity matrix. And I'll talk a little bit about the tricks that go into doing that community detection. Uh, and once you do the community detection, you'll get clusters out. And so once you have your clusters, you can then aggregate the segments within each cluster to get your CWMs out. Okay, um, so a few uh, conceptual ideas that went into getting TF Medisco to work. Well, it's actually a fairly elaborate algorithm, so I won't take you through all the little nuances and little details. I'll just focus on some high level ideas that are, are you might find are useful in other contexts as well. Uh, one idea was this idea of hypothetical important scores. Um, so the hypothetical important scores, they represent, uh, I've described them previously as an autocomplete of the, of the motifs. They represent the preference of the networks for bases other than what the network actually saw in the underlying sequence. Uh, and to give you an intuition for how you can get out hypothetical important scores, well, imagine your important scoring method was computing the gradients, right? The, the gradients will actually tell you uh, what what the preference was for seeing different bases other than the ones that you actually saw. And generally, when we use gradient based importance scoring, uh, you compute the gradients and then you just you mask out the gradients on the bases that weren't there. So we you can use gradient times input and that will tell you for each and your input is one hot encoded. That's why I say masking out. So gradient times input will basically take gradients and mask out the bases that weren't there. But if you did look at the bases, the gradients on the bases that weren't there, that would you would get a sense of how much the, the network would have liked to see those different bases present. Uh, and deep lift being a back propagation based method also gives you something like the gradients. It's the deep lift analog of the gradients. They're called they're called multipliers. Um, the multipliers are not exactly the same as the hypothetical contribution scores. There's some technical details there where you also have to consider the difference from reference. But uh, the idea is that Deepf can also very easily give you a readout of or, or an estimate of what the preference would have been on different bases, and getting that estimate of the, those preferences, you you get it in the same backpropagation pass as the original importance scores. It's not like you have to actually do perturbations to see what the preference of the network is for those other bases. So it's just a heuristic estimate of what the preference would have been for different bases. Um, so as an example, um, here is this actual importance scores around a CTCF motif. And the hypothetical important scores will tell you things like, oh, uh, you know, I really liked seeing this G, and I would have hated to see any other base in this position. But as for seeing this A over here, I would have also liked to see a G over here, though, you know, those would have been good. And when you have these hypothetical important scores, it gives you a lot more information with which to actually align sequence and compute their pairwise similarities, because even if there are subtle sequence differences between the sequence, the hypothetical scores will look a lot more similar. So we incorporate the hypothetical scores in order to, to get that uh, consolidation of similar uh, of, of instances that are of the same type motif. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so another uh, idea that uh, I and that I, I feel like this idea is actually very critical for getting good clusters is the idea of using a density adaptive distance uh, metric. 
And I'll give you some intuition for like where this idea came from. Um, I've been trying a whole bunch of different clustering alg algorithms, DB scan or uh, you know, different types of hierarchical clustering or what have you on the original affinity matrix. But for some reason, nothing looked as good as what TSNI was able to give. So, uh, you know, you, you pause and you think, what is it about TSNI that is able to, 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 to pull out these clusters nicely? Because you know, forget the, the step where TSNI is projecting into two dimensions. That's, that, that has nothing to do with where the nice clusters are coming from. The 2D thing is just a visualization for the human brain. But what is it uh, under the hood that actually allows TSNI to, to actually pull out these uh, clusters um, very nicely. And the idea is that uh, it's very inherent to the, the TCN algorithm. All oh, UMAP also has a step like this. Um, it recognizes the fact that uh, in many real world data sets, some clusters are going to be more tightly packed than others. So, for example, if you have uh, uh, a motif that is extremely restrictive, there's almost it, you, you, for every instance of that motif, you always have to have this very high affinity version of the motif. There's not a lot of variation in what that motif can look like. That is going to uh, look like a very tightly packed cluster. You know, it's, if, this is an example of just, uh, this, this is just a plot to illustrate that sometimes different clusters can have diff different densities. So you can imagine that a, a, a very stringent motif where you have to have almost exactly a perfect fit to the motif will look like one of these more tightly packed clusters. And at the same time, in your data set, you're going to have some motifs that are more lenient in what they can look like. And the nanog motif is, is a lot like this. Many times you'll have very weak instances of the nanog motif. Some instances will be stronger. And uh, something like the nanog motif is analogous to a loosely packed cluster, where not all the instances are going to be super similar to each other. And you know, it's also the, the fact that the nanog motif is shorter. So when you're computing similarities using your cross correlation like metric, that's going to also impact how similar those instances are on average compared to a very long motif where for the longer motifs are probably, the instances are going to look even more similar just because you have more bases with which to uh, you know, enforce that similarity. Um, so the, at, at the end, end of the day, what I'm stressing is different clusters are going to have different densities, different tightnesses of how strongly they're packed. And your, your metric, needs to, if you want to get good clusters, it needs to account for this. Some clusters are going to be more tightly packed than others. And the TSNI algorithm has this built in, uh, in that it adapts the notion of distance to the local density of your data. You might know if you use something like TSNI uh, or UMAP, um, the perplexity parameter. Uh, in UMAP, the analog of the perplexity parameter is the number of neighbors. I, I think that's, that's what it's called. Um, so what is, the, what is the perplexity parameter of TSNI actually do? Well, the very first step of TSNI, before you embed into two dimensions, this is the entirely deterministic step of TSNI, is that for each point, uh, it will define a probability distribution over the surrounding points. And that probability distribution is going to decay with the distance between each point and the surrounding points. So this is this probability. For each point, I, a, a distribution is defined over all the other points j, and the, the probabilities there exponentially decay with the distance between i and j, that rate of exponential decay is controlled by this parameter beta. And the idea is that this parameter beta is tuned such that that probability distribution attains a particular perplexity. Okay, very perplexing sounding description I've given there, that under the hood is very intuitive. So uh, a distribution that has a probability of one over k on k items has a perplexity of exactly k. Um, so intuitively, you can think of the perplexity as the neighborhood around a point that is going to be given a roughly equal probability, and then everything else beyond that neighborhood is going to have near zero probability. And what happens is when you define these probabilities and you're tuning uh, for each point, you're tuning that distribution such that uh, all, the, all the distributions will have roughly the same perplexity. What that's going to mean is that uh, for points that are in a very tightly packed neighborhood, the neighbors are going to be very close together. So in order for that distribution to get up the uh, this perplexity of k, uh, you're going to have to be very stringent about what is considered nearby to that point. Whereas for points that are in a more loosely packed region of the space, you can be more lenient. This value of beta will be tuned to be more lenient in order to give 
the uh, in order to achieve a, a neighbor a, a probability distribution with complexity k on its neighbors so if you didn't follow what what i said over there the intuition is that uh for each point the the notion of what counts as far away is tweaked according to how densely packed the neighborhood of that point is and that's what the complexity parameter is 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 controlling it's um, you have you'll be more stringent about what's nearby in denser regions of the space, and you'll be more lenient about what's considered nearby in in loosely packed regions of the space. So, uh, TSNI is computing these these density adapted probability distributions, where for each point you kind of tune your notion of what's considered nearby in order uh, to recognize this difference in packing, um, and those probabilities you can use them as your new affinities. So don't use your original affinities. Uh, take your affinities, pass it through this TSNI like density adaptation step where you, you tune the probabilities according to the local density of data and then supply the density adapted probabilities to the downstream community detection step and use whatever you want. Uh, I found that using uh, this like Leiden, which is actually a successor of Louvain community detection actually works quite well with these once you have these density adapted properties. If you don't do the density adaptation, the results don't look as good. Okay, so that was uh, the key idea over there. And I'm noticing that I'm coming up around time. So I'll just skip over this third idea, which was this alternative to cost correlation that I used. Um, it's, it's not as uh, important. Okay. Great. Um, so the idea is that once you once you run TF Medisco, you tend to get uh, these nice broad consolidated motifs. Uh, this is an example for a TF Medisco run for the 65 ZNF 143. Um, they tend to combine. Uh, and if you look across a whole bunch of PWM databases, this is what it tends to look like. Uh, but if you run TF Medisco on uh, on a model that was trained on one of these TF finding data sets, you get a single consolidated motif that encompasses all of these little uh, different PWMs. And the nice thing is that you're not actually losing any information uh, because if you were to take the single consolidated motif and then you were to go, go back and try to predict the strength of TF finding using a single TF Medisco motif, you actually do better than using all of the fragmented motifs uh, you know, uh, combined. So um, coming back to the BPNet example, um, in you get uh, for just the, the four different TFs, you get uh, 50 different motifs, but the motifs are actually distinct because they, they have associated diverse footprints. And these are the nine main motifs that pop up in the BPNet paper. Um, and there's, there's multiple motif instances uh, per region. You know, if you, uh, it, uh, so first of all, there's multiple instances of each motif and in each region, you will get it's you don't just have one motif driving things you have a diversity of different instances of these motifs uh, per region so that gives you a sense of the complexity of the, the tf finding um and uh you know to give an example of some of the interesting discoveries that fell out uh there were three different motifs uh, uh multiple binding motifs for nanog and each of the three different motifs had a distinctive footprint associated with it which is a a surefire indication that the motifs are actually different if their if their footprints are the footprints around the motifs are distinct um and just as external validation uh, uh this motif for the zig3 transcription factor was also produced by modisco and if you were to even though the model was not trained with zig3 chip nexus data if you were to use chip nexus data to compute the footprints around instances of the zig3 motif, you actually do see a distinctive footprint, which is in, an indication that, yes, zig is binding to these instances. It is real. And um, these cases where, so the interesting thing about the zig motif is that even, yes, zig is very distinctively binding here. You see a very sharp footprint when you go and you look at zig uh, chip nexus data. But you also see uh, nano footprints and KLF footprints around the zig motif. So, uh, and these footprints are weaker, they're more distributed. Uh, if you were to look at an actual instance of a nano motif, you see a very sharp footprint. And here you see a, a much weaker footprint for the nano motif. So this is something you can that you can interpret as uh, in, an evidence of tethered binding. So what's happening here is you have the canonical Zig3 motif, you have a very sharp footprint for Zig3. So Zig3 is definitely directly binding the DNA over there. But if Zig3 is also uh, has nanog and other TFs tethered to it, 
those TFs will show up as more distributed footprints. Uh, and you know that it's this is not the main uh, direct binding of nanog because direct binding of nanog tends to look like this. You get very short footprints. So these distributed footprints are how you can infer indirect binding. And so the VPNet paper talks has a very interesting analysis on uh, the way you can infer which TFs are, say, the pioneer TFs that are directly binding and opening the chromatin, and then which TFs are piggybacking onto those uh, pioneer TFs. And you see that with um, with OCT4 as well. Um, this asymmetry. Okay. Uh, another interesting finding that popped out was this periodic binding of the nanog motif. So it tends to bind with 10 base pair periodicity. Uh, so when you get the nanog motif out of TF Magisco, you can see weaker signal in the contribution scores uh, about 10 base pairs apart. Um, and uh, this, there's actually experimental ev evidence of this from in vitro assays. Uh, uh, because nanog is a homeobox transcription factor, and homeobox transcription factors tend to bind nucleosomal DNA, uh, and where this 10 base pair helical periodicity actually becomes important because of the way the DNA is wrapping around the, the nucleosome. So that was validated it, it, by completely independently uh, with the uh, in vitro NCAP CLEX data. Um, and there's other analysis that you can do. Um, so one interesting thing is if you look at the contribution weight matrices and you uh, you look at the frequency with which you observe contribution weight the instances of the motif with a particular spacing you can actually see that you more at the 10 base pair spacing you're much more likely to see instances of the nanog motif that far away uh, but if you would use pwm scans or instances called by different methods it's it's the signal is weak but it's not as distinct which really shows the advantage of using these contribution weight matrices to call motif instances. Um, and you don't just see this with Nanog, even with between SOX2 and Nanog or OCT4, uh, OCT4 SOX2 hybrid and Nanog, uh, you see this 10 base pair spacing preference. Uh, so this is a novel finding about how Nanog tends to bind. And also if you uh, look at the chip nexus, the maximum chip, chip nexus uh, footprint value, when you observe motifs with a particular spacing, you can see that when you have the, the 10 base pair spacing between the instances of the motif, you get much stronger chip nexus signal. Um, so this was all analysis in the VPNet paper. Uh, and I, one, uh, this is the last finding that I'll talk about. Um, TF Modisco, in, in when it was run on, on this data set, it produced several very long predicted motifs that also had very strong footprints associated with them. And these for these long motifs, they turned out to be transposable elements. A very large fraction of our genome, 50% uh, of our genome is actually repetitive because um, we have these transposable elements that originated from viral DNA that integrated themselves in many places across our genome. And it turns out that over the course of evolution, we have evolved to use sequences from those transposable elements as TF binding sites. Uh, so, uh, many of the motifs in our genome have evolved or been derived from these tr transposable elements. And you can very clearly see this when you have these transposable elements, but if you then look at the important scores at these transposable elements, the important scores highlight where within the transposable element is the binding motif. Um, and this very cleanly highlights the, the difference, very cold difference between using uh, TF Modisco contribution weight matrices and PWMs. Because PWMs, a very inherent assumption is that they equate the frequency with which a base occurs with the importance of the base. But because of the way evolution has occurred, a base may be very frequent simply because it was derived from a transposable element, which made many copies of itself in, in the genome. That doesn't mean that the transcription factor is actually binding there. And a really powerful advantage of a supervised model, especially one that's predicting footprints, is that it can tease apart which bases within the transposable element are responsible for driving that footprint. Okay. Um, and there was this discussion of do, does motif require fixed space? Uh, do motif grammars require fixed spacing, or can the face spacing be more flexible? And one of the findings of the BPNet paper was that motif syntax with this fixed spacing, that's largely a result of transposable elements. And it's not clear that that fixed spacing is genuinely necessary for TFs to, to bind together. The TFs can actually tolerate more flexible spacing. It just happens that in transposable elements, you get a fixed spacing because it, that's how the sequences are derived. 
Okay, yeah, so that brings me uh, just uh, before the end. I'm sorry that uh, didn't leave a ton of time for questions, but I'm happy to stay on. Um, so just as a summary, TF Medisco con consolidates important scores that are derived from machine learning models into recurring patterns. Uh, you get less redundant scores than what you get if you're visualizing convolutional filters. It does not conflate base frequency with base importance, and it reveals null motifs that are missed by traditional methods. Um, please go ahead and use the code. Um, we're wrap, wrapping up the paper, but I have you can use I have I tag every version of TF Medisco that I release, so you can just pick a version and stick to it if you want to use TF Medisco. And um, we're rapidly like putting finishing touches on the method, uh, so plan, definitely plan to publish that uh, very soon. But uh, yeah, so that is uh, that's all I have. And uh, happy to take questions. <laughs>